James chapter 4 uh, holds one of, I think, one of my favorite verses. It is a wonderful promise that God gives. James chapter 4, verse 7 says that if we submit to God and resist the devil, he will flee from us. It's a pretty wild statement. It's a pretty powerful promise, but one that we sometimes only do the second half and then don't understand why it doesn't work. The promise is not if you resist the devil, he will flee from you. That is not the promise. The promise is if you submit to God, then resist the devil, he will flee from you. Satan's not afraid of you. Satan's not afraid of me. When you talk about Lucifer and the devil, you talk about Satan, you talk about that serpent of old is what the book of Revelation references him as. Some people, it makes them shake and tremble, and that is fine. It should if you are not confident that he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. We don't come towards spiritual warfare. We don't approach the attacks of the enemy in our own strength. We better not. He doesn't flee from that. Oh, but when we submit to the Lord God Almighty, And he sees not you, but your heavenly father standing behind you. Trust me, he runs. He may roam about like a lion seeking whom he may devour, but he will run like a scared little kitten. It's true. Not because of you or I, but because of the grandeur of our God. Now, I would imagine you at times like I have experienced great opposition and difficulty in life. Spiritual warfare comes in a variety of flavors, but it is true nonetheless. It is real. There are actually demons. There are actually principalities and powers of the air roaming the halls of your life, seeing if any doors are left unlocked or any windows ajar that they could open and climb in. Maybe a Trojan horse they can attach themselves to to infiltrate your home your life, your walk with Jesus is real. Nothing we need to be afraid of. We just need to hang on to the Lord. But for me, often I find myself hanging on to the Lord, but there's this little chihuahua chewing on my ankle. It's like, knock it off. Get off. And the devil will always find something to try and chew on, some area of our lives, but submit to God, resist him, and he will flee from you. Now, this is not a perfect truth. There are exceptions to every rules. But as we go through life, I think Satan's learned humanity. He's been watching for a long time, and he knows what to bait the hook with. If you look at it from age demographics, youth oftentimes are simply distracted. I'm not talking about you, younger people. I am talking to you. Satan would love to distract you. More game time. More focus on your emotions. More of what you want. More of the riches and allurements of the world. More satisfaction of the sin nature. More, he's good at what he does. Simply distract. It doesn't have to be evil. It just has to be not God. I remember being taught, and I will tell you this, you probably know it. It's a very dangerous trick, so use it carefully. But whether it's a water balloon fight in the summer or snowballs in the winter, you know the best way to nail your friend, right? You take the first one and you throw it real high, slow arch, and as it goes through the air, the next one's a line drive. (laughs) But be careful. But look, younger people, and it's To some degree, all of us, but the younger you are, Satan just tosses these things high in the air. You go, oh, look, that's so important to me. And he will nail you with a line drive. Then there's the middle-aged. Me. (laughs) I am no longer young. I am not quite, I think, old enough to be considered a senior saint. But do you not go through seasons of discouragement? I remember telling my boys just a few days ago, hey, 
if you ever hit 41 years old and you have your family and things are going and you realize, gosh, at 41, I still have no idea what I'm doing. That's normal. Most people in that gap are just trying to figure today out. They're thankful they didn't die yesterday. They're not sure what they're going to do about tomorrow, assuming they make it through today. Now, that's an exaggerated statement, but let's be honest. For us, our first son has graduated high school. We've never done that before. I don't know what I'm doing. There's so many things in life that you come across, and it can feel like you're just spinning your wheels. You don't get it or know it, and you can feel discouraged. The wonderful movie Up. Remember Ellie and her husband have this vacation jar and it fills with change so they can one day go on their dream vacation and then the tire gets flat. So they smash the jar and use the change to fix the tire. And then as it fills up, oh, they're gonna go do something wonderful together and there's a hospital bill. So they smash the jar, use the money for the hospital bill and they're just, oh, I can't get where I want to be. Please. We have got to learn to rest in the Lord where we are, not fret over where we want to be. Youth often distracted, middle age sometimes discouraged. And it could be in many conversations I've had and things I've observed that the more senior class is simply deluded in thinking that maybe you have nothing left to offer. When in fact, you are the wisest, most experienced people on planet Earth. You have more to offer than any of us do. Don't believe the lie that you're done. In fact, there was a gentleman who shared that almost every truly significant thing that God did through him happened after he was 65 years old. I don't know if that's true for everybody, but it's encouraging to hear. And so Luke chapter 22, as Satan loves to lob different things, distract, discourage, dilute, Jesus speaks to Peter, and he says something to him, pretty significant. But read the Bible the way it's written. It's very important. There's an exclamation point in the opening portion, Luke 22, verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail, and when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Peter, the devil, has asked, for you. The serpent of old has put in a request to sift you like wheat. If you're not familiar with that phrase, it's when you would, after the harvest is finished, gather all the wheat that's been dried and you lay it out and you begin to just pulverize it and smash it and beat it until there's almost nothing left. Somewhere in the mix are the kernels of wheat. The rest of it has been ground to something that looks like powder. It's called chaff. And then if that weren't enough, you toss it up into the air on a breezy day and all the stuff that's irrelevant blows away and the wheat falls back down. Peter, the devil wants to attempt to destroy you. He's asked permission to beat on you so hard that it destroys everything in your life. And it's going to happen. But when it's done, all the chaff, all the garbage in your life finally blows away. Come back and strengthen your brethren. And Peter, don't worry. I have prayed for you. Many commentators believe that Jesus is referencing the prayer in John chapter 17. It would be a beautiful thing for each of us to go read this week. The prayer not only for Peter, not only for his disciples, but for the church that would come literally for you. 
literally for me. But Peter, Satan has asked for you. If it were a game show, not to make light of it, but Peter, come on down. Satan, tell him what he's won. Well, Jesus, a one-week trip to absolute grief, torment, and confusion. Included in this not-so-wonderful experience, of course, is an all-you-can-eat buffet of shame, regret, and anger. But wait, there's more. While attempting to annihilate all that Peter believes, he will be pummeled into something that looks like split pea soup. His emotions, completely destroyed, will try to deflate his faith so far that if we're successful, he won't be able to recover not only to Jesus, but not even to his calling at all. Peter, Satan's asked for you, but I have prayed for you. Satan's not afraid of you. He's not afraid of me. But greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. When you are at making advances for the kingdom, you are going to frustrate and infuriate the enemy. It's going to happen. Whether that's us collectively as a church body or it's you independently as a child of God, if you take a stance and you commit yourselves to living in a way that honors the Lord, you are going to frustrate and infuriate the enemy. If you think about just collectively what God has done in less than a year, taken the National Day of Prayer back from the Satanists, begun to raise up people to minister to children and youth and young adults, gathering together next month to begin to pray about missions and taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. Women's beginning to come together, a vision and clarity, men's prayer groups coming together with clarity. We're about to ship Bibles off to India and Sudan. We met two weeks ago. Let's build a church for the Lord. Let's plant something in Idaho that is a beacon of hope that cannot be hidden. Let's have VBS and have 300 or more kids gather together for a week to learn all about the gospel of Jesus Christ. I promise you, you have frustrated the enemy. It doesn't have to be church. If you individually have said, I, that's it. I am going to love my wife the way that Christ loved the church. Ladies, if you have decided that's it, Ephesians 5 tells me to respect my husband. This world tells me not to, but I love that man and I love Jesus more, so I'll do it. If you've said, you know what, the world's going to do what they're going to do, but we're going to be a home that follows Jesus. I don't care what you do. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The moment you decide, that's it, I'm done with these addictions, I am done with these habits, and I'm going to honor the Lord with my life, I promise you one thing. God will give you the strength, and Satan will hate it. So rest in the Lord. There are actually principalities and powers of the air. Now, it manifests in different ways. Like I said, there is a variety of ways in which the enemy wants to infiltrate and frustrate the work of God in your life individually and together as a congregation. Paul warned about, though, right, we don't wrestle flesh and blood, people, but the enemy uses people to get to us. There's a guy named Alexander. He was a coppersmith. And Paul warns the church, this guy did me great harm. He got in the way of what God called me to do, and you better watch out for him. This is a very real, serious adversary. There's the young little, I believe she was 12 years old, following Paul around, mocking him. Oh, servants of the Lord. She was possessed by a demon. Eventually, he gets absolutely fed up, annoyed is the word, and cast the demon out. But then her owners, because she was a slave to these fortune tellers and idol makers, get raging mad, turn the whole city. Paul gets beaten, thrown in prison. The enemy's real. Because following Jesus is real. It's not a Sunday morning talk. It's not a story in a book. It is everything that we're to be about. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, writing to a church. Paul loved Thessalonica uniquely. Read through it. His heart for them was 
so, so, so dear. Verse 17 and 18 says, but we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, were not there, but not in heart, endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desires. I can't wait. I want to be with you so bad. Therefore, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again. But Satan hindered us. Wouldn't you love to ask Paul, what did that mean? <laughs> what did that mean? Were you robbed and your money was taken so you couldn't afford to get back? Did people lie about you and so you were not given the opportunities to travel the way you wanted? Was it discouragement, abandonment? What was it? It was Satan. Time and again, Paul wanted to be there, but Satan hindered us. There are more than four ways, but in the book of Nehemiah, you can turn over to it, there's at least four ways that we're to be aware of. Four things that the enemy would love to do. But it's at this point, as you're turning to the book of Nehemiah, I do need to warn you, church, today we're going to act very much like the church. Shouldn't be a surprise, right? But real quick, just to make sure the coffee took its effect, right? I need everyone to raise their right hand real quick, make sure that's working. Okay, good job. All right, left hand real quick. Okay, that's good. Real quick, this is a hard one. If you're able, do me a favor, just stand up real quick, just for like a second and a half. You'll be all right. Good job. Okay, you can sit down. <laughs> this will matter in a moment. We're going to participate in ministering to each other before we go home. Following Jesus and being knit together as the body can be uncomfortable, but is necessary. By the way, it's your first time visiting. It's not normal. Maybe it should be. But the book of Nehemiah, if you're not familiar with the Old Testament, specifically the book of Nehemiah, uh, roughly a little over 150 years before this takes place, Jerusalem is attacked. It is overthrown. The walls come crumbling down. The temple is toppled, just ruins everywhere. Enough time goes by. Ezra, it's the book right before Nehemiah, is given permission to go rebuild at least the temple so the Jews have somewhere to worship. It's not that grand or or, or amazing, but it is rebuilt. It is pretty exciting. But the village is in ruins. The walls are in pieces down on the ground. And eventually, God stirs Nehemiah with a deep, grievous burden. One thing to note, and maybe some of you are in it today, when there is a deep grief, God might be about to do something great. It's not comfortable, it's not fun, but oftentimes a season of deep sorrow and grief leads to something that is greater than we are ourselves. Nehemiah goes to the king and says, look, my city's in ruins, I am grieved, I am burdened. He goes and checks it all out and he gets tremendous favor. Letters of passage, protection from the military, even provisions of what he'll need to rebuild. And so he goes into town, Nehemiah chapter 2, look at verse 18 if you have your Bibles this morning. And he gets there and all that's left are peasants and farmers. Everyone else had been taken captive. But and I told them of the hand of my God. He tell, gets all the people together. He's now in Jerusalem. And I told them of the hand of my God, which had been good upon me. And also the king's words, and that he had spoken to me. That's the favor, the provision, the protection. So they said, the people respond, let us rise up and build. Then they set their hands to this good work. It's incredible. Something brand new is about to happen in a place that had seemed dead for so long. God moves Nehemiah, gives great favor to Nehemiah. Even the people now are of one accord with Nehemiah. But here's that hand exercise. Has anyone ever experienced when God's doing something good in your life, not everyone's happy about it? Anybody ever feel that one? Well, there are two, really there's more than two, but two guys that stand out. 
who were not very happy with what was God was doing. Nehemiah chapter 2, still there, verse 10 though. So when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official, right, these are guys who are authority, heard of it, they were deeply disturbed that a man had come to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. Deeply disturbed. That verbiage, it means something in them snapped. They broke. That whatever evil resided in their hearts and minds was awakened and stirred. They lost it. You're going to do what? Can you imagine living in a time where you're just going to go mind your own business and try and establish something that's right and people can't handle it? I mean, I couldn't imagine living in a time where if you said, you know, you, you can believe whatever you want, but I believe that, that marriage should be between a man and a woman. What? That's all it takes? I, I believe that children should be raised by parents, not free to choose how they want to be raised. What? What is happening? I'll tell you right now. When one side is losing its mind, it's probably because God has begun to do something. We don't wrestle flesh and blood. I'm not pointing at any individual at all. But we're living in a time where God is moving. But we cannot be intimidated out of the great work before us. You can please some of the people all of the time, and you can please all of the people some of the time, but you cannot please all of the people all of the time. So then the question comes, who is our goal? What is our aim? Church, as the body of Christ, the believers and followers in Jesus, whose opinion matters? His. His. It's it. I am sure you have felt what I have felt on and off throughout life, but in this last year, it's been almost comical, and the Lord and I have worked this out. And now I just sit back and laugh, like, man, Lord. Someone had asked me maybe two weeks ago, like, oh, wow, is God just showing you all kinds of amazing things? It's like, no. <laughs> There's a sweet little psalm that just says, I'm just going to hide under the shadow of his wing." And I'm like, Lord, there's monsters out there. I'm just going to tuck in, and uh, that's it. That's where I want to be. Isn't that where you want to be? Near the Lord, under the, the care and covering of our great God? But in the last year, it's been so funny. It just made me tuck in more, and now I'm loving it. I have been accused, you're, you're super legalistic. I'm like, oh. And within 48 hours... You're too free. Like, what? What? Proverbs 29, verse 25. The fear of man brings a snare. You're trapped. Whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. Who, who, do, no, 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 I'm not, no, I'm not that either. I'm not, I'm not. You're going to lose your mind. Fear of man, you're stuck. But those who trust in the Lord are in the shadow of his wings, are safe. But haven't you realized, and I pray you have, if not today, realize, thank God for the furnace of refinement and the pressure of people's opinions. Doesn't it make you get closer to the Lord, digging deeper to the word, and then you have convictions that are as pure as gold, and both seen and unseen, no world could convince you otherwise. Without that, what do we have? Nothing. So pretty quickly, though, four things. Nehemiah is gathered together. The people are excited. Sambalat and Tobiah and some other people are not so happy. They've snapped. They've lost their mind. And so the enemy wants to disrupt everything going on. 
Specifically today, there's four things we'll look at. One, he will despise you. Look at your Bible, still chapter 2 of Nehemiah, verse 19 and 20, though. We'll kind of keep inching along together. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official and Gershom the Arab heard of it, they laughed at us and despised us and said, what is this thing that you are doing? Will you rebel against the king? So I answered them and said to them, the God of heaven himself will prosper us. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build. But you have no heritage or right or memorial in Jerusalem. They will laugh and despise. Oh, you're going to do what? You go to church on Sundays? Oh, man. You're one of those people? That's so silly. I mean, I guess, you know, someone's got to be like a caveman dragging their knuckles around. Oh, you're going to, you're, wait, hold on. You're going to do what? Oh, that's so silly. Come on. Remember my years of construction? Every Friday, all the guys you work with all week long out in the back parking lot getting drunk. Come on. It's like, no, I'm, I'm just going to go home to my wife. <laughs> Whatever. You're whipped. I'm not enslaved to your bottle, though, am I? Oh, hey, man. We were out at this club and all the girls and like, ah. I'm just going to go over this way. How come you don't laugh at our jokes? You Christian? I remember when I came, I didn't know how to talk about it. New believer. Pretty soon my nickname was The Christian. It's okay. But they'll laugh. And that's okay. They'll despise. It means to think little or nothing of. And that's okay. The enemy will try to make you feel like your faith is a joke. It doesn't matter what the world thinks. To the world, the gospel's foolishness to those who are perishing. It is a joke. Ah, but to those who are being saved, it's the power of God. It's okay. You can laugh. But be careful when you begin to think little of your faith. Nehemiah chapter 3, we won't read it just to sum it up. Nehemiah gathers the people, breaks them into groups, gives them assignments so that they would be more effective in their work and their labor. It's pretty smart. And then Nehemiah chapter 4, it's no longer an idea, it's a project. They are going for it. And as they are going for it, as you are advancing in your walk with the Lord, the enemy is only going to get more frustrated, making you think little of your faith. Well, that didn't work, so maybe I can discourage your faith. That's oftentimes the second one. Nehemiah chapter 4, starting in verse 1, we'll just look at the first three verses. But it so happened when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall that he was furious and very indignant, and he mocked the Jews. And he spoke before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Are they gonna, they're going to strike these little peasants. They're going to fortify themselves. Will they offer sacrifices? Like, oh, is their worship going to do something for them? Will they complete it in a day? Like, oh, come on, please. You're never going to get this done. Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish? Stones that have been burned? Your materials are trash. And then Tobiah chimes in. Now Tobiah, the Ammonite, was beside him, and he said, whatever they build, even if a fox goes up on it, he'll break down their stone wall. You're a joke. No, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to love my wife. Oh, come on. For how long? It's not going to last. Even if a fox jumps on it, it'll just crumble. Come on. No, no, you know what? That's it. I'm going to start following Jesus starting today. Okay, yeah, but tomorrow's Monday. Come on. Younger people, you got the whole summer break to draw near to Jesus, but come the end of August. Is that all it was? And the peer pressure comes back in, like, oh, come on. Your parents aren't here. Do what you want. It's not going to last. You're going to be strong enough. You're right. That's why I submit to God first. 
then resist the devil, and that's why he runs. Your resources, what are you going to do? You're just going to use that rubble? Yeah, if I have to. If I have to. Look, we're not competing with the world. I'm not trying to build with the world. The world will always be better at entertainment, at excitement, at allurement. That's fine. We should do a good job and use the resources God gives us. And what if they're not that amazing? That's fine because we're not building it for the world. We're building it for the Lord. Your home, you're not building that for the world, for your neighbor to be like, wow, I love that you pray with your kids every night. <laughs> but for the Lord to say to you, well done, the good and faithful servant. Oh, your resources are nothing. Let's try another hand thing. This is getting deep and a little bit raw, but gentlemen only. Anyone ever know you're supposed to pray with your wife? Keep your hand up if you know it, but have not done it at times. Don't we think little? Ah, I don't know how to pray good. It's just the rubbish. So? Ah, they don't want, they, 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 we got in a fight yesterday, and they're going to think it's dumb if I try and pray. It's just, it's not even going to last. And gentlemen, if you think little of your calling, everyone will think little of your calling. Ladies, has the Lord ever led you? To support your husband, anybody? Anyone ever fail to do it the way God told you to? If you think little of your calling, no one else, no one else will think more of it than you do. Kids, whatever that even means, not 41. You ever know you're not supposed to do what your friends are doing? I'm not going to put you on blast when your parents are watching, I guess, but, <laughs> but you went along anyways? Why? The temporary praises of people will not last. They'll mock, they'll laugh, and if that doesn't work, they will discourage. But I'm telling you right now, I'm not talking about a church building or an organized ministry, but your life. Build it the way that will honor the Lord. Build it. You're going to have to live in it. So build it in a way that honors the Lord, regardless of age, regardless of season, regardless of regret. His mercies are new every morning. It doesn't matter. Guys, if you're, you haven't prayed with your wife and you know you're supposed to, if all you pray is, uh, uh, <clears throat> Lord, God, oh, hmm, bless my wife, amen. And you run out of the door. <laughs> Do it. Ladies, if you know you're supposed to be a, a source of strength to your husband, and God, whatever God's saying, make him a cup of coffee in, the, coffee in the morning. I'm tired. Go back to bed after. Make him instant coffee. Like Whatever it is, whatever it is. If you know the world's beating him down and he just needs to be told he's not a loser, tell him. Tell him. Look, I don't know about you. Oh, you're going to build this whole thing in a day? You're never going to finish this project. It's too big. Maybe. But I would rather die with a half-finished vision that was too big for the Lord, to do in one lifetime than to get to heaven and find out I live too small. Build a lineage that will last to children that you'll never meet. And I love his response. When people are mean and they're throwing words and daggers, what do you say? You sharpen your tongue and don't you give it one, I'm just going to get him right back. <laughs> Look, Peter was there when they were mocking and ridiculing Jesus. Reviling is the word. You read the letters that Peter wrote, and he said, Jesus never returned reviling for reviling. In fact, in this segment, they've been laughed at, despised, now discouraged, and made little. And so what does Nehemiah do? It's the very next verse. Look at verse 4. Just the first part. 
Hear, O our God, for we are despised. He prays. He prays and then they get to work. They build. They stay faithful. Well, if the enemy can't make you laugh at your own faith, if he can't discourage you, then he will most certainly try and divide. He will try to divide. It's exactly what happens. Nehemiah chapter 4 still, look at verse 7 and 8. Now it happened when Sanballat and Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored and the gaps were being closed, right? There's progress. That they became very angry and all of them conspired together to come and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. Look, God will fight our battles. They're going to come get us. Maybe. Look, Pharaoh full on did. Didn't work. The waters parted. The nation of Israel went right through on dry ground and the Lord swallowed them up. No one had to do anything. These guys, are there. they're going to really come. They think they are, but the Lord foils their plan and their whole goal was to what? Create confusion. But I promise you this, you ever experience confusion, it is not the Lord. It's either your sin or Satan. But 1 Corinthians 14, verse 33 For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as it is in all the churches of the saints. Look, I've never met anyone. You guys ever smell a gas leak in your house? I think I smell gas. I have never met anyone in my life. It's like, I think I smell gas. You should pray on that. (laughs) What? What are you talking about? You're going to go have some cereal. You smell the milk. smells rancid and spoiled. Like, oh, I'm going to pray on that. You put it back in the fridge. <laughs> Absolutely not. You throw it away or go find the problem and fix it. You know, when there's confusion, the church doesn't just get to tiptoe away. God's people don't get to be cowards. If there is confusion in your home, in your friendships, in your business, in the church, doesn't matter. We are to deal with it. The Bible says if you are in song and you realize, you realize someone has something against you right there, don't sing one more song, don't put another dollar in the tithe box, go seek restoration with your brother or sister in the Lord. You don't have to pray on it. Oh, it's my responsibility? It's both responsibility. Because the verse also says that if you're sitting there and you have something against someone, that you go privately and you tell them and you work it out so that you gain your brother back. You smell confusion, you handle it in love, in grace, in truth. Well, who has to do it? Who starts that conversation? Biblically, the one who loves Jesus most. So if you're content saying you love Jesus less than the person you're divided with, which I don't think any of us want to do. But confusion, it's never of the Lord. It's never of the Lord. We don't run and hide. Nehemiah 4, this whole thing goes on, and what does Nehemiah do? He prays. Look at verse 9, chapter 4. Nevertheless, we made it our prayer to our God, And because of them, we set a watch against them day and night. They prayed and protected. You smell confusion in your life, sit down and figure it out. If he can't come from the outside in, he'll just come from the inside. It's the other way division works. Now, I don't know if any of you guys, right, since we're just doing confession day and we're like, yep, I fall all the time, I fail, I messed up. Any of you guys, by nature, I'm sure in the Lord you don't have this problem anymore. We're new creations. But anyone by nature have a short fuse? Oh, ooh, that's a lot of us. Now, we need to pray that God just makes our fuse, like, unravel like a garden hose. So as it burns down, it's just, like, it never gets there. Because Satan comes with a spark, and then we fan the flame and blow it up. Division from within. There's a moment now, the next portion, in Nehemiah chapter 5, 
He finds out that the brethren were taking advantage of the brethren. People were suppressing and isolating and, and making situation terrible. There was a famine. There wasn't enough food or money. People's children were being sent into labor. It was horrible. And the brethren were doing it to the brethren. It was messed up. And Nehemiah, whether he has a sure fuse or not, did the right thing. Chapter 5, verse 6 and 7. And I became very angry when I heard their outcry and these words. Here's the trick. After serious thought, that's the garden hose. I was angry, so I just let him have it. Ugh. Wrong move. I was angry, so I determined I'm never talking to him again. Wrong move. I became very angry when I heard the outcry and these words. After serious thought, I rebuked the nobles and rulers and said to them, each of you is exacting usury from his brother. So I called a great assembly against them. After serious thought. The Lord will lead you. And that's the whole submit to God. Then resist the devil and he will flee. And what was once great division amongst the brethren, though they were busy about a great work, was now brought together again in unison. Our fourth thing, and the final one, is in chapter 6, a distraction. Now it happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall and that there were no breaks left in it, though at that time I had not hung the doors and the gates, that Samballat and Geshem sent to me, saying, Come, come, let us meet together among the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me harm. So I sent messengers to them, saying, I'm doing a great work, so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? But they sent me this message four times, and I answered them in the same manner. Hey, man, it's really coming together. I know the doors aren't hung, but wow. Like, hey, can you come down here and hang out? Just, just let's talk. What's going on? I can't come. I am busy about a great work. Letter number two shows up. Hey, yeah, I know you said you're busy, but it won't take long. Just, just come on down one day. I am busy about a great work. Letter two shows up. Letter three shows up. Letter four shows up. I cannot come down. I am busy about a great work. It is not haughty or arrogant if it's true. Hey, hey, come on over here and party with us. I can't. I am busy about a great work. Hey, 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 just turn your computer on in the middle of the night. No one will ever find out what you're doing. I can't. I am busy about a great work. Hey, just manipulate the finances. The government will never find out. I am busy about a great work. I don't mean the little words that might slip out of your mouth if you stub your toe. But oftentimes it seems believers fall headlong into sin because they're not busy about a great work. I can't come look at what you're looking at. I can't come do what you're doing, I am building a life that honors the Lord. I'd love to meet. I just don't have time. You'll have to pick. Maybe today is the day. Choose this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But the enemy loves to wear you down. So stay busy about a great work. How we got Samson, isn't it? Sin Delilah, pester, 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 capture. Well, all of this stuff, through the power of prayer and the focus of the work and the faithfulness of God, 
52 days. That was it. 52 days and the walls were back up. 52 days and the gates were hung. 52 days. All the attacks were real. The enemy was loud. They attacked in multiple fronts. But those who stayed busy about the great work saw the faithfulness of God. When you return, Peter, strengthen the brethren. Peter, Satan has asked for you, and he's going to pulverize your life until there's nothing left. But when he's done, you won't be done. What's left will be a faith that Peter actually talks about in 1 Peter, and you wonder where he gets this idea from, that when you've gone through the furnace, your faith, which is more precious than gold, though refined by fire, intensity, will be found to praise, honor, the glory of Jesus. Look, Satan's best cannot overcome the promises of God. He can't. John 16, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Remember when you did the whole hand-raising thing? The whole standing up thing? We're going to end a little different. But look, has any of you guys ever been through marriage and it was rough, you weren't sure it was going to work out? If I asked, you still in it? Would your hand stay up? Anybody, uh, anybody move from far, far away and leave everything behind, and the new car smell is gone. I mean, Idaho is beautiful. Anyone ever feel that one? Anyone feeling it now? Doesn't retirement look glorious to all of our people? We're 41ers. Oh, to retire. Look, can I, like, anyone have to learn how to be retired? That is not easy. You think it's easy, huh? It's not easy. Church, if we don't learn how to pray together, we may as well just shut the doors. That's what Nehemiah did. Oh, they're attacking, they're discouraging, they're laughing, they're thinking little, they're trying to divide. No way. We're going to pray and be persistent. We're going to pray and protect, and we're going to see the faithfulness of God. 